Greetings YouTube and welcome to the channel. I'm your host Hadron. This week on the Top 10 we will be exploring my personal favorite Top 10 Ancient Mysteries. This list is of course purely opinion based and is easily open for interpretation any way that you wish. More aptly put, these are the 10 Ancient Mysteries that fascinate me the most. Without further delay, let's get on with this week's episode. Number 10. The Piri Reis Map Antarctica was discovered in the year 1820. Or was it? The Piri Reis Map was discovered in 1929. Drawn in a gazelle skin by an admiral of the Turkish fleet in which the document is named for, this weathered map revealed something that was a bit odd. Drawn in 1513, well before the discovery of the southernmost continent, it depicts something that could easily be interpreted as exactly that. Showing the coast of Africa and Brazil, and the Caribbean islands, it also shows much, much more. As the coastline of South America veers downward, it suddenly banks right. The southern coastline is chillingly similar to the actual coast of Antarctica itself. Piri Reis, with access to surviving records in the libraries of Constantinople, wrote the document itself on what was compiled from source maps drawn from as early as the 4th century BC. Taken from 20 charts and other sources, of which Piri claimed 8 Ptolemaic maps, this historical oddity is a compilation of knowledge from sources now lost to us. The biggest mystery is of the actual coastline of Antarctica itself. Locked under substantial ice and snow covered nearly year round, the actual coastline cannot be charted save for modern equipment to breach the mile thick ice. Compared by a USAF air commander in 1960, to a study done by a Swedish and British expedition in 1949, it was his conclusion that the map showed the coast of Queen Maud Land of Antarctica as it would have appeared before it was covered in ice. How was this possible? A fascinating glimpse into the possibilities for certain. Was it written millennia before the dawn of our current civilization by an even more advanced culture now lost to us? Or is it simply happenstance and misinterpretation? You be the judge. Number 9. The Legend of King Arthur You know the tale. Heck, I think most of us do. Arthur, Camelot, Lancelot, Guinevere, the Round Table. How much of it is true, or is it all just fantasy, invented to entertain? With the collapse of the Western Roman Empire, the island of Britain found itself plunged into darkness. Ruled by conquering Germanic tribes, the local Roman and Britain natives found themselves living in a new world entirely. With the power vacuum caused by the collapse of the empire's hold over the island, many Germanic tribes warred for control of the countryside. History becomes very murky during this period and without proper record keeping, it is no wonder that historians used to call this period the Dark Ages. With the rise of the Germanic kingdoms of Essex, Wessex, Sussex, East, West and South Saxon territory respectively, the island population of Romano-British descent found themselves pressed in on all sides. Much of the tale of Arthur has him as a champion of the native population, standing against the Germanic tide. Then again, he may never have existed at all. And that is where the history ends and the legend begins. Perhaps he was an exaggerated version of an existing person, or maybe just an invention of a clever writer. The legend itself stems from the first written short version of Arthur from the Annals Cambrai, written in the 900s. Two accounts in this book cover Arthur's victory at Baden Hill, and his fall in the strife of Camelon. The actual written stories of Arthur really come from the 1100s and Geoffrey of Monmouth's story of Regnum Britannia. From this account, written over 500 years after the purported life of Arthur, we draw most of our modern understanding of the Arthurian legend. Merlin, Camelot, Excalibur, Mordred, the island of Avalon all stem from this source. The stories are pretty wild and fascinating in equal measure, and it is to be said that there are no contemporary accounts from the life of Arthur if he did in fact exist. Indeed, there is very little in the way of hard evidence. Perhaps the accounts of Arthur are penned from earlier documents now lost to the mist of history. We will never probably know. Number 8. The Voynich Manuscript Within Yale University lay an intriguing and most fascinating of books. 240 pages of mystery wrapped within a single tome. Carbon dated to around 1420 and written on vellum, the style of the book heavily suggests it was created during the Italian Renaissance. Nobody knows for sure who wrote the book and its origins are also hotly debated. What everybody can agree on, however, is that nobody has any idea what it says within its pages. 
named for Wilfred Voynich, who discovered the book at a Jesuit college in 1912, he purchased the book and brought it to America to be studied. Cryptographers have studied the pages at length and the document has never been decoded or translated despite the belief that the pages do in fact potentially contain a written yet unknown language now lost to us. Within the pages are pictures of herbs, astronomy, astrology, cosmology, plants, roots, both real and unknown to us among other things. Many have attempted to trace the document to other historical and known figures, yet others believe it is mere fabrication by Voynich himself. Given his knowledge in dealing with antique books, he would likely have had the knowledge needed to manufacture a brilliant fake, likely hoping to make a fortune to the right buyer if this was indeed the case. Yet with the carbon dating of the document, this calls this idea that the manuscript is a fake into question for certain. Maybe he found a blank book dating from the 15th century work well as a canvas for his masterpiece. Possible, but amazingly unlikely. Or maybe he found the real deal, a book written in a completely unknown language now lost to the mists of history. One thing is for certain, the book is indeed an extraordinary work which continues to puzzle those who delve into its pages to this day. Number 7. The Antikythera Mechanism If I told you this image represented a piece of gear from an 18th century sunken ship, I bet it would be of little interest. Fascinating for certain, but not a world-changing discovery. By that time, metallurgy was well on its way and we had headed deeper into the Industrial Revolution. But what if I told you this device was from sometime during the period of ancient Rome, perhaps circa 200 to 80 BC? The Antikythera mechanism is an object which seems so modern, yet is anything but. Recovered from a shipwreck in 1901 off the Antikytheran island, the mechanism has puzzled many for over a century. What is it? What does it do? Who built it? How did they do it given the time period? Questions, and not much more. Surmised to be an analog computer using gears, it is believed to have been constructed by the Greeks in or around 87 BC. Many other experts are divided and believe the initial calibration date on the device stems from either 178 BC or 204 BC respectively. Objects of this level of engineering and complexity would not exist until the 14th century over a millennium after the supposed possible construction of this wonder. This first known analog computer's purpose is still open for speculation. Perhaps used for astronomy, or to keep time, or maybe both? Built a bronze sheet and now in several fragmented pieces, this ancient mystery is still studied to this day. It is truly an amazing statement of the capabilities of ancient civilizations and calls into question just how many discoveries and ideas have been lost to the ages and sit beneath the waves. Number 6. The Nazca Lines the Nazca Lines consist of hundreds of distinct geoglyphs hundreds of kilometers south of Lima, Peru. These massive works cover an area of over 400 square kilometers of arid, windless desert. These enormous carved images depict many different forms. Some are the depictions of living animals, a monkey, a spider, a condor for instance. Another fascinating glyph is an image of a giant human staring upwards towards the heavens. Some of these are the size of an Olympic stadium impressive to say the least. Then of course there are the lines themselves, some of which stretch over 10 kilometers long, nearly perfectly straight, intersecting with each other to form patterns. It is believed that these geoglyphs date from between the years 500 BC and 500 AD. They were drawn by simply exposing the dirt below, removing rocks and creating shallow depressions in the soil. The dirt below the surface is of a different color, creating a perfect canvas to create these fascinating monuments. To what? That is the question. What purpose did they serve? And what's even more interesting is the only real way to see them is from the sky, above, looking downwards, in an airplane. Why would the Nazca construct these series of artistic depictions that they could never see themselves? Were they created to be seen from above, from their gods, or perhaps somebody else? Number 5. The Great Pyramid at Giza the greatest wonder of the ancient world still standing, many throughout history have asked themselves the same question upon setting sight on the pyramid for the first time. How did they build that? Indeed, this is a question that even today is hotly debated among scholars, engineers, and scientists, and those who hold less conventional views. It was the tallest building on earth for over 4,000 years. Weighing in at a whopping 6 million tons, the Great Pyramid is even today with our modern skyscrapers and buildings 
a spectacle to behold. Built in the 4th Dynasty by the pharaoh Khufu around the years 2550 to 2490 BC, it contains an estimated 2.3 million large blocks. Recent discoveries have put to rest the idea that the great structure was the toil of slaves that had been commonly believed. It is now understood through archaeological evidence that the Great Pyramid, like the other pyramids in the Giza Plateau, were built by about 20,000 or more paid laborers. Bodies discovered of men who died during the construction have shown that these workers were well fed and received excellent medical care for their time. Contained within the pyramid are three main chambers, the Queen's Chamber, the King's Chamber, and the Grand Gallery. Most of the blocks of the pyramid were quarried nearby the pyramid itself, with the outer casing of limestone brought 13 kilometers away via the Nile River. Most of the mystery surrounding the pyramid really boils down to the logistics, the lifting, and the effort required to move the blocks into place. Herodotus speaks of machines that were used and aided in the construction of the pyramid. Since he wrote of the pyramid over 2,000 years after its construction, this claim is really unable to be substantiated. However they were built, they still stand today, defiant against the ravages of time, a lasting monument to an age long past. Number 4. The Ark of the Covenant One of the most important and holiest artifacts of the Hebrew Bible, the Ark of the Covenant still fascinates many, including myself to this day. The Ark was not to be touched, nor looked at when uncovered. Normally obscured by skins or cloths to protect the people as it was moved, the chest was used to carry the remnants of the Ten Commandments, brought down from Mount Sinai by Moses himself. Purportedly built on the orders of God, and done so according to exacting specifications, it was to be held in the tabernacle. It was constructed of gold and held aloft by wooden poles to keep it from touching the ground. Claimed to possess supernatural powers, it was used by Joshua to part the Jordan River to allow the Israelites to cross. It was also stated that it brought down the very walls of Jericho itself. Tens of thousands, it is claimed, were killed by just looking upon the Ark during its time. Featured in the Bible from the time of Moses until the Divided Kingdom, it effectively disappears from any known record around the time of Jeremiah. Housed in the first temple which was conquered by Babylon in 587 BC, the temple was razed to the ground and its people scattered to the winds. Was it taken back to Babylon as a spoil of war? Or perhaps fearing it would be taken, the Israelites hid the Ark somewhere, maybe still remaining there to this day. There are also breadcrumbs that point to its resting place perhaps in Jordan. Some claim it is held in Ethiopia to this day. And then there's the popular idea that the Knights Templar took the Ark during the Crusades from the ruins of Solomon's Temple and took it back to Europe. Others believe that the Ark never existed at all. Whatever the truth is, there will always be those who never stop hunting the Ark. Number 3. The Lost City of Atlantis Was Atlantis a real place or just a legend? If so, when did it fall below the waves? Plato told the tale of Atlantis as an allegory on the hubris of nations in two of his works, Timaeus and Critias. Written in 360 BC, Plato lays out the tale of the island of Atlantis with several key details which have inspired generations of people to search for the lost city. He claimed to be recounting the tale of Solon and his visit to Egypt in the year 580 BC. He then dates the fall of Atlantis to 9,000 years before the time of Solon, which would put the city's destruction at around 9600 BC, give or take. A tale of the struggle between Atlantis and the ancient Athenians it follows the story of how wealth and decadence leads to corruption. The invading imperialist Atlanteans strike out from beyond the Pillars of Hercules, the Strait of Gibraltar in modern day, and they enter the Mediterranean, sacking and attacking, pillaging before being stopped by the much more virtuous Athenians. The Greek gods, angry at the Atlanteans, sink the island in a day and a night through earthquakes and fire, crushing their avarice and putting an end to their ambitions. The moral lesson is clear, but the question remains, did Atlantis actually exist, or did Plato just make up the entire tale? Even if the tale is made up, it is possible that Plato drew the story from real-world events. The volcanic destruction of the island of Manoa, which took place a thousand years before Plato, was a catastrophic event which ended Minoan civilization. The island of Santorini, home to the Minoan people, was nearly completely destroyed, much of it collapsing into the sea. It is easy to glimpse how Plato could have drawn inspiration from this real-world event. Given the details included in the story, many writers and explorers were quickly drawn to the idea of Atlantis, believing it was completely real. 
Thus began the search for the island, which still continues even now to this day. Did Plato make it up? Or was he relaying the tale of true events? Number two, the Bronze Age Collapse. The Bronze Age Collapse is easily one of the most fascinating mysteries drawn from ancient history. Around the year 1200 BC, within a few short decades, a thriving civilization that had endured for centuries came to an abrupt end. It was in this cataclysmic event, or series of events, that the Bronze Age ended and the old world came crashing down. The biggest question is, how? Why? Even to this day, we have only theories and speculation as to the how and why. The vast Bronze Age empires thrived, with huge surpluses of food which fed large cities. Trade was abundant in this period. Egypt, Babylonia, Syria, the Hittites, the Mycenaeans, the island of Cyprus were all key players in this time frame. Around 1200 BC, however, the party came crashing down. Attacks from the sea and raiding parties began to ravage the countryside. Chaos and destruction erupted in Greece, with cities being burnt and destroyed. In Anatolia, virtually every major city was sacked and left in ruins. Who was attacking who? Why was it so widespread? The Egyptians struggled to hold back the tide of these mysterious attackers and did so at great cost. The other nations of the Old World were not so fortunate. Historians have come to refer to these mystery attackers as the Sea Peoples. Likely a loose coalition of people from as far afield as Sicily, these invaders struck with ferocity and little mercy, leaving death and terror in their wake. The Mycenaeans, the Hittites, and Cyprus fell to these attackers. Egypt held them at bay with huge losses, but the collapse of their neighbors and the resulting trade implosion left the Bronze Age empires greatly weakened, even as far away as Babylon, which also felt the effects of this carnage. What drove these sea peoples to invade? There are theories of potential European famine that drove them to attack. Archaeological evidence now points to this as a possible driving force behind said collapse. What may have compounded this problem was famine and crop failures in the Bronze Age empires as well. These empires likely had already abandoned many cities before the sea peoples even arrived searching for food for themselves, and perhaps plunder. The systems collapse theory establishes this idea that the Sea Peoples were not so much of a threat as previously believed. It holds that the already weakened Bronze Age empires were easy prey, and when the Sea Peoples did finally arrive, they kicked in the door of an already rotten structure, which began to collapse in on itself. Number 1. Gobekli Tepe Discovered in 1994, Gobekli Tepe, or Papeli Hill, is easily one of the most fascinating mysteries of antiquity. Located in southeastern Anatolia, part of Turkey, this Neolithic site defies explanation. The discovery of this site has begun to shatter our expectations and understandings of the age of human civilization. Dating back to around 10,000 BC through carbon dating, it greatly predates our understanding of when people began to build such structures. What was the site used for? Who built it? This ancient puzzle generates far more questions than answers. The site may be the oldest built in human history, built at least 8,000 years before the Great Pyramid at Giza. Only a fraction of this site has been studied to date. We know very little about it, or how it was built, and who constructed it. Near the site itself, there are zero signs of housing or evidence that people lived there. The location has no water, the closest source being five kilometers away composed of 20 concentric rings which were constructed and then systematically buried. We have absolutely no idea why. Counterintuitively, the oldest stones are the best constructed, while the newer stones are poorer in quality. Why is this? It makes no sense that the builders got worse at building them as time passed, and not better. Around 8000 BC, the building stopped, and the structures remained buried through the ages, ready to be discovered in the modern era. Many of the pillars adorned by carvings, some of which are very intricate and impressive to behold. The site is covered with animal bones, some of which are now actually extinct. Also recovered were three human skulls, modified potentially used for worship. Another possibility of the site, it was used for astronomy maybe. The site may also have been used as a memorial. After it was abandoned in 8200 BC, the first civilization in ancient Sumer would not arise until 4500 BC nearly 4,000 years later. Rediscovered by the German archaeologist Klaus Schmidt, he and his team peeled back the layers of history. In 2003, a geomagnetic survey uncovered the true scale of the site. As said before, 20 rings were surveyed, 
and only a small fraction have yet to be exposed, leaving many, including myself, to wonder what other secrets hide still in Gobekli Tepe. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of my Top 10 series. If you feel that I've earned it, please click the subscription button, notification, and like buttons below. I will probably do another Top 10 Ancient Mysteries video at a later date, as there are still so many that I was unable to cover in this video. Also, please follow me on Twitter, at HadronTV, to be kept in the loop for any future content. Thanks for watching.